morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord together. Would you join in our call to worship? Um, it is an affirmation from 1 Timothy. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 600, Wonderful Words of Life. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 20. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our children's message today comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. It's the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And the video uh, that we'll show today comes from Kids on the Move. It's time for a Bible story. A long time ago, in a town called Jericho, there lived a man named Zacchaeus. Whoa, what's going on with that name there? Zacchaeus? How is anyone supposed to pronounce that? Uh, like this. Zacchaeus. Zacchachusa. No. Zazachino. What? No, it's like Zach. Just say it after me. Zacchaeus. Zachareka Ding Dong. All right, now you're just trying to make it weird. Yeah, I know. So who's this Zach Cheeto guy? What's his deal? Zacchaeus was kind of an interesting guy. First of all, he was famous. Everybody in Jericho knew who he was. Nice, rolling like a big shot. And he was totally rich. I'm talking fancy schmancy clothes, waterfall pool, blinged out toilet seat, 
He was loaded. Cha-ching, my man, Zach Ebers, living the life. Also, he was super short. Wait, w really? That's part of the story? Actually, yeah. What's the problem? Hmm, just seems like you're getting a little personal there. I don't know, maybe jealous about the whole super rich fancy toilet thing? No, it's really part of the story. All right, all right, just saying. So what, is this guy like everyone's favorite person? Um, no, actually, everyone hated him. Whoa. Really? Yeah, like everybody. I'm talking men, women, puppies, clowns, little baby squirrels. You name it. They did not like Zacchaeus one bit. Man, what gives? Is Jericho just like a big town full of jerks? No, there was definitely a reason. You see, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Ah, that explains it. He's the tax man. Classic case of the old income removal service, huh? Pretty much. Zacchaeus would go around and collect tax money from all the people in Jericho. But wait, hold on. That's, that's not that bad, right? He's just doing his job. Why does everybody hate him so much? Well, he wasn't just doing his job. He was a thief, a liar, a low-down, dirty, good-for-nothing crook. He used his job to steal from people. That's how he got so rich. Zacchaeus had a terrible reputation, and for good reason. He was not a good dude. Ah, now it makes sense. So what happens next? Does everybody, like, beat him up and take back all their money? Nope. Here's what happened. One day, Jesus was traveling around the countryside, teaching and healing people like he would often do, and he happened to pass through Jericho. News spread fast that Jesus was there, and soon a huge crowd gathered to hear him speak. Jesus was kind of a big deal whenever he went places, huh? Oh, yeah. Tons of people came from all around to listen to Jesus, including Zacchaeus. He wanted to see Jesus and hear what he had to say, but there was a problem. The crowd was too big, and Zacchaeus, you know, was just a little fella. Mm, hashtag short man problems. The struggle is real. So what'd he do? Well, he wanted to see Jesus so badly that he was like, whatever, I don't care, and climbed way up in a tree to see over the crowd. Man, he really wanted to see Jesus. No joke. Here's a grown man all fancy and rich and what night climbing up a tree. He didn't care if people thought he was weird. He just wanted to see Jesus. I mean, probably wasn't that big of a deal. Like, from a distance, people probably just thought it was a kid, you know, because the whole short thing. Well, somebody noticed, and not just anybody. Jesus himself sees this guy climbing a tree to see him, and he stopped talking to the crowd. Everyone went silent as Jesus looked right at Zacchaeus, and the crowd waited on pins and needles to see what Jesus would say. Oh, man, this is it. Jesus is about to lay the smack down on Zacchaeus for being a low-down, dirty thief. He's going to be all like, I know what you've been up to, you little nasty. You've been stealing and scheming, and it's time for you to pay. You didn't think you'd ever get caught, huh? Well, guess what? I'm Jesus, and I know everything. So pay up, punk. Ba-boom, mic drop, and the crowd goes wild. <sighs> uh, no, that's not what happened at all. Jesus stood there, looked Zacchaeus right in the eye, and said, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. Let's go to your house and have dinner. Today, I will be your guest. Whoa, forget mic drop, more like jaw drop. You really said that? Yep. Even though he knew Zacchaeus was like a total scumbag? Like, why? Jesus knew that Zacchaeus had done some really bad things and had a lot of sin in his life, but Jesus also knew that Zacchaeus couldn't do anything bad enough to stop him from loving him. He wanted to spend time with Zacchaeus so that he could save him from the sin in his life. Whoa, so what happened next? Well, just like he said, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house and had dinner with him, which was a huge deal. Before this, nobody hung out with Zacchaeus, and here's Jesus going to his house for dinner as his guest. Mmm, it's like I've always said, there ain't much that a good burger can't fix. You never said that. Well, it's still true. After Zacchaeus spent time with Jesus, his heart was totally changed. He apologized to everyone for what he had done and gave half of his belongings to the poor. Then he paid back all the people he'd stolen from four times what he owed them. Wow, he's like a totally different dude. I mean, still vertically challenged and everything, but on the inside, whoa, he's awesome. His life changed that much just from like spending time with Jesus? Totally. That's the cool thing about this story. It shows us this. Jesus already knows everything about you, all the good, all the bad, everything you've ever done or ever will do. 
But that doesn't stop him from wanting to be close to us. And just like Zacchaeus, the more you get to know Jesus, the more he will change your heart. Dude, that is so cool. The next time I climb a tree, I'm going to think about this story where Jesus changed old Zacchaeus' heart. Well, it's Zacchaeus, but yeah, that's a cool idea. Actually, scratch that. Next time I eat a Cheeto, I'm going to think about it because, let's be honest, I'm going to eat a Cheeto way before I'm going to climb a tree. Hashtag snacks for life. Yeah, sounds about right. The end. A good children's message brings the scripture to life and is a little entertaining to you. <laughs> uh, have you ever considered that salvation is as much a miracle as any physical healing? In the story of Zacchaeus, we witness a radical transformation from sinner to righteousness. Jesus questions in Luke chapter 9 about who people say he is, tells us that it's important to him that his followers give a clear witness. So who do you say Jesus is, and how has that truth brought about a miracle in your own life? Let us pray before we dig into today's word together. Oh, Jesus, we are humbled with gratitude to be in your presence and to learn from your word together. We're so thankful for your gospel, that you are our Savior. Quiet our minds and open our hearts to receive your word, that we might recognize the miracle you have done in us and proclaim the good news to our neighbors. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us envision this scene for a moment. Luke chapter 9, verse 18 begins with, Once when Jesus was praying in private, and his disciples were with him. This account follows the feeding of the 5,000, but we're not told where or when this particular uh, prayer meeting is happening. I envision Luke retelling all the stories of Jesus while a scribe writes them down. As they work on chapter 9, Luke begins with Jesus sending out the 12, which increased the attention of King Herod, who asks in verse 9, Who is this Jesus I hear such things about? And then to illustrate the power of Jesus and how his power works through his disciples and the growing attention, Luke tells the story of the time they fed 5,000 people on just five loaves of bread and two fish, and there were 12 basket full, baskets full of leftovers. What an amazing miracle. And now perhaps Luke is pacing the floor in his excitement as the Spirit leads him to string the right stories together to make a point that even Luke doesn't know that he's making just yet. The very next story he tells is this scene where we read, and then there was this one time when we were praying together in private, no crowds, just Jesus and the 12 of us. He often prayed in private, but this time we were with him. Can you picture them all sitting in the wilderness somewhere? Maybe they've just stopped for a rest between towns, or maybe they've got up early, and went to a garden to pray. Notice we read that Jesus was praying, and the disciples were there. That to me sounds a little bit like some of my experiences praying with a youth group. Whether we were holding hands in a circle or spread out in a room on couches and the floor, someone would be praying, and heads were bowed, but eyes would peek around the room. Sometimes someone would giggle, and other times... Someone would restlessly swing their arms and the arms of those they're holding. Not everyone was always tuned in to that attitude of prayer. I don't know if these men were restless, but it does sound like perhaps they were not all focused on prayer. So Jesus draws them into the conversation. Who do people say that I am? They respond easily with all the answers they've heard from the crowds. And then Jesus makes it personal. Who do you say I am? This, again, I envision somewhat like asking the obvious question in Sunday school. Most people know the answer. 
but they second guess themselves. They don't want to be the first to speak because their answer might be wrong. So the ever bold Peter speaks up. You are God's Messiah. Like, duh, guys, we know this one. And then Jesus predicts his death. A little over a week later, they witness the transfiguration of Jesus, where, Messiah, where Moses and Elijah appear with him on the mountain, followed by the casting out of a demon, a second prediction of Jesus' death, an unwelcome reception by a Samaritan village, and finally, three illustrations of the cost of following Christ. So many different miracles are told in this chapter. What does this little Q&A session have to do with any of it? All of these miracles are proof of Jesus' identity, as we mentioned last week, and also the certainty of faith that Jesus is God our Savior is a miracle in itself. Take Zacchaeus, for example. Everyone knew this guy was a sinner. Sometimes we don't acknowledge that about ourselves or about others. We try not to judge people, but his character was obvious to everyone. He was a lying, cheating, no good tax collector. But the thing about Zacchaeus was he wanted so badly to see Jesus, just to see him. It was that same desire that filled the woman with the issue of blood as she desired just to touch the hem of his garment and be healed. Maybe what Zacchaeus really wanted was for Jesus to see him as something other than a liar and a tax collector. Jesus does see Zacchaeus. Jesus even calls him by name and says, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus comes out of the tree, and at some point in their time together, his character does a 180. He stands up and declares to Jesus that he's going to give half of his possessions to the poor, and he's going to pay back his neighbors four times the amount that he stole from them. To this transformation, Jesus responds, today salvation has come to this house, not just to this man, but to this household. Jesus continues, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now previously, if someone had pointed out to Zacchaeus, and I'm sure many tried, that he was a liar and a thief, he would probably have laughed at them or denied the statement. Or he might have responded in apathy, not caring for his victims, only for himself. The scripture doesn't say that Jesus pointed out any of Zacchaeus' sins. It just tells us that Jesus saw him. As Jesus sees everyone, that includes his sins and his desire for something different. To be seen, to be accepted, hope. Whatever that specific desire was, it had something to do with Jesus and the salvation that can only come through him. This was a miraculous transformation, and Jesus celebrated it with this declaration of salvation to the household. People, you have just witnessed the miracle of salvation. The Son of Man, the Messiah, sees you too. He sees you in a way the world cannot and offers you this same miracle, the greatest miracle, the miracle of salvation. Crowds of people gathered around Jesus everywhere he went, hoping to receive a miracle of physical healing, not realizing that, as Carolyn Moore writes, these miracles primed the pump for the main message, the truth of the risen Christ who has come to redeem the world. So what miracle has Christ done in you through salvation? Who were you before you were saved? What happened or what was that desire that led you to Christ? And who are you now? As a child, I just wanted to be liked pretty much by everyone. I was not very confident. I was easily embarrassed. So I jumped on every bandwagon making fun of other people because I didn't want to be the next target. I knew that did not help my acceptance ratings with anyone, and it hurt others. I was fearful in friendships. I was fearful in big things that I couldn't understand. 
but I was growing up in the church, participating in vacation Bible school, Sunday school, the children's choir, sitting in worship with Grandpa and Uncle Keith, my mom or my stepmom, my aunt, or others in the church family whom I had come to realize loved me because of Jesus' love in them. I had a Sunday school teacher who taught us about salvation when I was eight years old. It was like being in that tree and seeing Jesus see me. Jesus loves me even when I'm all wrong. And all I have to do is welcome him into my heart like Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus into his home. Done. Sign me up. I knelt by my bed that night because I thought that's how you had to do it and prayed. I'm sorry for all my sins. Jesus, please come into my heart. I don't think my transformation was so instantaneous as Zacchaeus's, or maybe it was in that I began to focus on liking other people instead of focusing on receiving friendship. I became more compassionate and an includer. I didn't want others to feel left out or alone. I wanted everyone to know that they were loved. That instant switch from searching for love for myself to giving it away is pretty miraculous and life-changing. That moment of salvation opened me up to acknowledging my sin for what it is and participating in that sanctification process as I continue to grow as a disciple. I'm sure Zacchaeus struggled with things too, Yes, he stopped cheating people, and he returned what he had stolen, and more. But the total package of righteousness or Christian character and perfection in love is a growth process. As John Wesley says, we're always going on toward perfection. So as you continue to seek Christ this Lenten season, remember your own story and give thanks for the miracle of salvation that you have received. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, we thank you for the miracle of salvation. Thank you for transforming our hearts and our lives, for turning us from sin toward righteousness. We know that we still have a long way to go, But we thank you for the process and for loving us so much that you offered us salvation while we were lost. We pray for our neighbors, our family and friends who have not yet accepted your gift of salvation. We ask that you continue to pursue each one and that they too would know your great love for them. We also pray for those who are sick, battling or recovering from a number of health concerns. God, be with each one. Strengthen them and heal their bodies and their spirits. We pray, Lord, for our nation and leaders at all levels. We ask your spirit to guide each one. And in the name of Jesus, we cast out any demons that would seek to harm, to do harm in our community, across our state, and in our nation. Cleanse and protect our leaders, Lord, from all forms of evil. Your will be done. We pray for your church. Protect and strengthen your people where their witness is unwelcome. Forgive us for the mess we've made of our shared witness as we have not been faithful to your word and your will. Put an end to the infighting and the schism so that your church can heal and the gift of salvation be made known in our communities across all nations. God, multiply your kingdom through us. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Our closing hymn is number 181, Ye Servants of God. Receive these words as your benediction. Go forth in peace, remembering and sharing the gift of salvation you have received. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs>